Hey, I'm Justin from Alcatree, and in this video, I'm gonna show you how we manufacture the Alcatree AU. There are seven made stages that each board goes through. Printing the solder paste, placing the parts, reflow soldering, depanelization, testing, washing, and packaging. For double-sided boards like the AU, steps one through three are repeated for both sides. Typically, you wanna do the lightest side of the board first, so that during the second phase of reflow, the components are less likely to fall off. In the case of the AU, this is the back side. The PCBs we use are panels of 16 in a 4x4 grid. This makes the whole process much easier as you only have to deal with one panel all the way up until the end. Let's get started. The first step is to get solder paste onto the panel. Solder paste is a mixture of flux, a chemical that helps solder flow, and tiny little beads of solder. Solder paste comes in various grades, which specify how small the beads of solder are. A finer paste will generally print better, but cost significantly more than their coarser counterparts. We use T4, which is a nice middle ground and works well for parts down to 0201. Another consideration with solder paste is the type of flux used. The solder paste we use has a flux that is water washable and no clean. That means that the residue after soldering can be removed with water, but if you don't remove it, it's not a big deal. Some solder pastes require chemicals to remove the residue, and if you don't, the residue can be corrosive, causing damage to the board. Solder paste is best stored at a cool temperature, so we stock ours in a small fridge. It's important to let the paste warm up to room temperature for a couple of hours before printing, so it isn't too stiff and prints well. Now that we have the paste, we need to get it onto the PCB, but only exactly where we need it. For this, we have a stencil. The stencils that we use are called frame stencils and are a thin sheet of stainless steel stretched tight on an aluminum frame. The stainless steel sheet is laser cut to expose the areas of the board where we want the solder paste. The printer is essentially a glorified clamp. Its job is simply to hold the stencil and PCB in place. This printer also has knobs that allow the PCB to be shifted to precisely line up with the stencil. These large frame stencils can be a bit pricey and overkill for one-off runs or even small runs of boards with larger components. Some companies sell just the metal foil stencils or even plastic ones that you can use on simple boards. For example, here is a stencil we used for the Mojo's HDMI shield a few years ago. It is simply a piece of plexiglass with some extra boards glued on to hold the PCB in place. The stencil was aligned and then taped down along the top to act as a hinge. While a simple printer like this works, there are some major drawbacks, such as the fact that there's no way to fine tune the alignment, which is critical to do for small components like the ones on the AU. With our printer, first we've set up these large blocks of aluminum which hold the edges of the board. The goal is to get coarse alignment with the stencil, but it doesn't need to be perfect. If it is the first side, we can support the bottom with these large plates. If it is the second side, we use these smaller pins that can go between the components. With the board in place, we can check the alignment. By turning the adjustment knobs, we can fine tune the board's position. Once everything is aligned, it's time to print. Simply get some of the paste out, then use the squeezy to evenly distribute it over the stencil. The angle and pressure you use takes a bit of practice to get right. Typically, you'll have to do a second pass to clean up the leftover paste. The second pass is at a much steeper angle to ensure all the paste is picked up. And with that, we can lift the stencil. The paste is now covering the pads and the board is ready for components to be placed on it. Next is the flashy part of the build. The printed board is then transferred to the pick and place machine, which as the name suggests, picks components from reels, trays, or tubes and places them precisely on the boards. This piece of equipment is critical given that it's much faster and more precise than me with a pair of tweezers. Our machine is the VP2800HP CL64-4H from Small SMT. Small SMT is a company that specializes in the more affordable pick and place machines. This machine is one of their higher end models and is an impressive piece of gear for the price. Obviously the machine is already set up and ready to go, but the setup is a major part of the build. Most parts come on reels. These are long strips of paper or plastic with pockets that the parts sit in. The parts are held in place by a thin plastic cover. To get access to a part, the pick and place needs a way to advance the tape and peel the cover back. Most of the parts we use are on modular feeders. These feeders can be easily removed from the machine to replace the parts or move them to a different location. Each one of these feeders has a piston that is activated with compressed air. When actuated, the piston causes the tape to be advanced and peel back the covering. These feeders are awesome and can support parts as small as our 0201s or even smaller, all the way up to stuff like our large seven segment digits on the IO elements. The only real drawback with these feeders is that they're fairly expensive and outfitting an entire pick and place machine with them can really rack up the overall price. Our machine also has what small SMT calls push feeders. Instead of every reel getting its own pneumatic piston, 
it uses one piston for up to 35 parts. The drawback of the push feeder is that all the parts need to be on 8mm tape and they're a bit of a pain to swap out. However, these aren't really an issue for us as we have plenty of small resistors and capacitors on 8mm tape that have 10,000 parts per reel and are only used once or twice on a board. Some of the bigger parts, like the FPGA and GDR3 on the AU, come on trays. Our machine has enough work area to hold two trays. Trays don't really require any special gear to dispense the parts as they're all just laying there ready to be picked up. The connectors on the AU come in tubes. These are dispensed via vibration feeder. To hold the connectors, we designed and printed a small insert. This insert ensures that the tubes stay in place when we swap out the male and female connectors. Our machine has three cameras. One attached to the head that looks down and is used to calibrate the head position and detect the placement of the PCB, and two that look up. The two up-looking cameras have different fields of view that can be used for different size parts. Let's take a look at the software. In the top left, we can see what the machine sees. Under that, there are some manual controls and everything else is for setup. There was a lot of work that went into setting everything up. You have to program the specific location and pickup height for every part, as well as how tall the part is, what nozzle to use, what vacuum pressure you expect to see when the part is properly picked up, the camera settings so that the part can be properly aligned, and the part's original orientation. With all the feeders set up properly, you then need to set up the boards. This involves telling the software the location of all the parts, their orientations, and the feeders to use. You can also set up fiducials for the machine to use to automatically detect offsets in the board's placement. Now that everything is good to go, and the board is in place, we can run the machine. The head will find the first fiducial we programmed on the board, and then locate the second. From there, it starts placing parts. Our machine has four nozzle holders, and for this run, each one has a different size nozzle. This allows it to pick up every part of the build without stopping for a nozzle change. We have this board set up so that it will try to use each nozzle to pick up as many parts as it can for each trip to the camera and board. We use the visual alignment for every part. For some parts, this isn't critical and can be turned off to save time. With our builds and current setup, we find the machine places about 20 parts per minute. The bottom of the AU has 98 parts, so the full panel of 16 takes about 70 minutes. Let's speed that up. Once all the components on the board have been placed, we do a visual inspection to see if anything went obviously wrong. With the board looking good, it goes into the reflow oven for a couple minutes. We have a batch style oven instead of a conveyor belt style. A batch style oven like this has less control over the reflow profile and has a much lower throughput than a conveyor belt oven. Ours is a bit of a hybrid as you can queue up another board to go in as you remove the first. The internals always stay hot and the circulating fans control how fast the board heats up. This gives it a much higher throughput than a typical batch oven, which needs to cool after each cycle. Once the oven cycle is completed, we remove the board and let it cool. Once cool, we flip it over and do it all again. The panel is now complete and ready to be split, but first we remove the plastic covers on the connectors used by the pick and place. Then we remove the rails along the edges and split the boards apart. The boards are visually inspected for any noticeable defects. The boards that pass are then electrically tested. For the AU, you have to program the FTDI configuration EEPROM and program the FPGA flash with our test code. This test ensures that the FPGA, LEDs, reset button, and DDR3 are all working. Any boards that fail here are set aside to be reworked later. The passing boards are then ready to be washed. If you remember from way back in the beginning of the video, the solder paste we used has a water washable no clean flux in it. That means that this stage is technically optional, but the residue from the flux doesn't look great, so we wash it off. To do this, we need pure water. We have a reverse osmosis water filter that removes basically everything from the water. This is stored in this water jug that is used to fill our ultrasonic cleaner. The boards and water go into the cleaner for about 15 minutes of ultrasonic blasting. Once done, we drain the tank and rinse the boards off in clean water. This helps to remove any water that may have dissolved flux in it that can cause harmless but ugly water spots. The boards are then usually left to fully dry over a day or two, but if we're in a hurry, we can use our oven on a low temperature to quickly dry them as well. With the finished product ready to go, we just need to seal it up in an anti-static bag to protect it. We have an impulse sealer and a roll of anti-static material for this job. First, we cut appropriately sized pieces from the roll while also sealing one of the ends. The board is inserted and sealed in. The roll we use is a little big for these boards, so we seal and cut off the extra. 
From there, the board is ready to be put into our retail packaging. And now it's ready for sale. I hope this video has given you a good idea of what goes into small-scale electronics manufacturing. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribe to our channel for all our future videos, including a series of digital circuit design tutorials using this board. Thanks for watching.